This week on the Eldritch Lorecast. This week, standing in for James Haig is Peter Lee. Hello there. D&D Beyond Maps. I've always wondered if the 3D VTT is going to be too much for people. So the campaign for Aberration is live right now on GameFound. Working on this game, I'm greatly inspired by sort of the, the seven samurai, you know, tr- training the villagers. I'd love to know what the great beast is, because right now I'm just picturing the great animal from the Swan Princess. Uh, what inspired me on the great beast was actually Princess Mononoke. Wizard of the Coast, they've also got Planescape. Opening the Ark of the Covenant and melting my brain in that I read all of the plaintiffs back. All of that and more, right now. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's episode of the Eldritch Lorecast, the number one tabletop RPG podcast in all the realms. That's right, this week we are also the number one board game podcast, which I've wanted to transition to for a little while, but I've never, never quite found the space, but this week we have the space. My name's Ben Byrne, by the way. Uh, and I am joined this week, standing in for James Hake, is Peter Lee. Peter, thank you for joining us uh, on this week's episode of the Lawcast. Hello there. I have Dale Kingsmill. I have Sean Mernwin with me as well. Uh, Sean, I'm going to ask you first, what is your, and I assume you have one, favorite board game? This is a question that became painful for me recently because we moved. And I had to get right. rid of many games in my board game collection. So I had to decide. I gave away probably over 100 board games to libraries and schools and clubs. So what do we keep? And we had mm-hmm. the save pile and the maybe pile and the go pile. And the first <laughs> board game that went into the save pile, because my whole family loves it, and I'm not saying this just because Peter's here, was Lords of Waterdeep. Right. <laughs> and then the next games... <laughs> That went in were the adventure, uh, the D and D adventure design uh, <laughs> series, because they're nice and big, and you can play them over and over again. And then Carcassonne went in, and then those games that you know, are kind of quick that we love, uh, Dominion, and those ones that you always go to. Uh, so I can't choose just one because obviously the last one you played or the one that you're ready to play is going to be your favorite. Uh, but. Mm. The, those, the ones I just named are very, very high on my list. I feel like that's a good call because my answer was probably going to be getting it in nice and early for you this week, The Witcher Watch. I am really enjoying Go On Board's The Witcher, uh, Old World. It is, it is it's been very a little enjoyable. while since we had a Witcher Watch. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I do suspect it's also, be- like it's not a perfect board game, and I do suspect it's also because it's the board game that I'm playing at the moment. You know, it's the one that I'm kind of investing my time in if I want to crack out uh, a, a board game. Uh, Dale Kingsmill, what about yourself? What would be your favorite board game? Uh, for me, I gotta give it to Dead of Winter. Um, specifically, oh, that's a good yeah, specifically before the Monkey Lab extension, because uh, I'm I'm not a big fan of like Lab Monkey uh, tropes. So, um, but I but that base game, love it. The the crossroads mechanic gives so much like additional narrative flavor to a game that's already so full of it. I love that it's it's like a combo thread. You know, it's not just a zombie game that's following all the zombie tropes. It's like, what if zombies, but also winter, Um, which, you know, (laughs) really love that flavor. Really fun for me. Um, I think, it, you know, it's got so many different ways that you can play it, which is great for different groups of people. You know, if they're into PvP sort of trader mechanics or if they just want a nice game where you're all, you know, doing teamwork. Um, I think that's really good. And the big thing for me, and this is so sappy, but... When my friend first gave me the game, uh, which is very, a very generous birthday gift, but uh, I opened it up and I was looking at all the characters you could play and it was like 50% female characters. And that was just like such a moment for me where I, I was just overwhelmed by this nice little thing, especially in a world where so many uh, board games assume masculine pronouns in the rules. Sure. Representation yeah. matters. That's it matters. definitely something like when we were working on Horrified, one of the very important things was for the heroes to be not just a bunch of white male dudes. What would be your favorite board game? This is this is a tough one because a lot of it is historical on, you know, what is your favorite game in the various eras that I've played games over my entire life? Like if I go, sure. what was the game that turned me into a gamer? And that would be the original dungeon board game. I was probably like 
eight or nine years old when I first got that one. So, you know, it was around the time the D&D cartoon was on television and things like that. And, and so, you know, D&D was great, but it was the dungeon board game that made me really, you know, sort of fall in love with, with, with board games and D&D. But the one that really sort of I really fell in love with was To Call, sort of a, a South American digging up treasures, all sorts of things like that. I, 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 I sort of that was the one that sort of, you know, took me by heart and like, yeah, that's, that's, Mm -hmm. that's a big one. I feel like there's, there's always this aha moment as you do your board game life, right? It's, oh, well, I only played Monopoly or sorry, or, or those uh, truths and ladders, (laughs) sorry, snakes and ladders for, for you folks uh, down under. And you, and you get this. And then it's the next aha moment when you realize there are different ways to play board games. Then there's the next aha moment when you get cooperative board games. And it's, it's such a fun journey to take. Um, if you are a lover of such things. Speaking of which, Peter, you've designed, you know, many of the beloved board games, many of Sean's beloved board games, as it turns <laughs> out. Um, for folks who, and you've also, you were uh, one of the designers on 5th edition as well. You mm-hmm. kind of strayed into the tabletop space. Um, yeah. Well, not strayed, but kind of made your mark, I suppose, on the tabletop space as well. Um, for folks who may not know uh, you or your work, well, they'll know your work, uh, where will folks know you from? What's your, your okay. sort of background? So I started at Wizards in 2008. Before that, I was I was doing some volunteer work for Wizards at Gen Con for their their D and D miniatures game at the time. So I started doing that around 2004, I think. The lead designer for the miniatures game was deep in fourth edition, and they needed another hand to work on the miniatures game, and I applied for that position, and that's. That's what got me in the door at Wizards. So um, yeah. I, I am uh, uh, an avid, uh, I would say, an ex-miniature painter at this time. I, I, I kind of have slowed down ever since a, a neck injury, which kind of, you know, made it too painful to paint. Um, you can see wonderful scar lines. The other guy's still in the hospital because he was a surgeon. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I had a fusion on on two. Uh, uh, or three vertebrae refused together. So I, I don't get right. to uh, paint as often as I do. But you can see, I'm going to turn my camera and, and scare everyone where there's a wonderful curio cabinet off in all the out yes. of sight lines in my office that is filled with miniatures, uh, you know, that I, that I painted. That was sort of my, a big love uh, mm. for me. And that's why you, you see a lot of miniatures in in my games um so what happened was the D miniatures line was starting to you know after fourth edition came out and and oil prices were going through the roof 2009 2010 and the miniatures just started not being something that could uh could be maintained uh by wizards so they um they, you know, rolled back from that, and in in the, about the same time, the the board game line was coming up, and that's when the Castle Ravenloft project was starting up. That right. was the first adventure system game, and since I was really familiar with the miniatures, and there were going to be miniatures in this game, I kind of, you know, snuck my way onto that project. I wasn't officially on it at first, uh, and I kind of like steamrolled my way onto it because you know i love board games and eventually i you know did uh, so much for the game that they added my name in the actual rule book not necessarily all the sales text because that was done months before you know how that sort of goes but in the rule book i'm credited you know that was sort of the big the big start for for my 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 board game career was castle ravenloft and then wrath of the chardelon and then one day i was chatting with uh, my buddy Rodney and we were saying what you know kind of games we would you know love to sort of make and we each had half of a game where he wanted some sort of worker placement style game and I wanted some sort of getting the band back together where you know instead of it was it, the original idea was something like oh yeah you need uh you need uh a drum player and a keyboardist and a guitarist or whatever. And, and you need to make songs with that, but you know, that's not really something that wizards would necessarily publish, but what if we made it adventuring parties? And so that what ended up being, you know, these two ideas sort of coalesced and became what is now Lords of Waterdeep. And that was definitely a, a, a fun, beloved project where Rodney and I were taking our lunch hours and kind of making it on the side and then, 
pitched it to the company. Hey, let's do that. And I remember showing it to the brand team and you know, like halfway through the game, they're like, we got to publish this, <laughs> you know, so right. that, was, that was really exciting, you know, so that was something, you know, a lot of projects at Wizards, you know, are, are, are often top down where they're coming from, you know, your bosses. There aren't very many that go, you know, from necessarily from the workers up. And that was that was one that made it through. And so I'm I'm pretty proud of that one. And that game, I would say, is the was the most blessed project I'd ever worked on, where things always went its direction, which is so rare in, you know, the creative process. But eventually, you know, board games started there's only so many that they could do, and and I moved on to the fifth edition. Thing and uh, the fifth edition project. And a lot of my work there was what I referred to as opening the Ark of the Covenant and melting my brain in that mm-hmm. I read all of the playtest feedback. And every every single thing that, you know, everyone would write and and those... <laughs> so we've been talking about how much our brains are melting reading the playtest material. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> I can only imagine how much more brain melting it yeah. is reading the feedback. <laughs> Yeah, it, and and a lot of it was I, I kind of felt like a, a a navigator on on like where are people having the biggest problems uh, with oh. with the current uh, the, you know the current playtest materials identifying ad, ad, identifying what's not working and then you know sitting down especially with Rodney and, and making fixes and then presenting those to Jeremy Crawford and that was sort of the the iteration loop that we would go through is, is, you know, we get the playtest feedback, we'd identify, you know, the worst things, and then we'd make changes and put it out there again and re- repeat over and over again. When fifth went out the door, um, I moved over to the Magic the Gathering team for about two and a half years. From my experience at Wizards, I tried, I did everything where, I, you know, I was miniature <laughs> yeah. games, board games, role-playing games, collectible card games, you know, uh, digital games because I worked in Magic Duels for a while. So literally, I did I, I did everything, which is you know a, an immense education. Uh, it does mean that you know I am a a bard in that you know I I, right. I am a jack of all trades and a master of none. But the nice thing about board games is it is really a multi disciplinary disciplinary sort of thing where you know. You need design, you need sort of the role playing elements, you need, you know, so all those things, you know, miniatures, if it has miniatures, you know, all these things come together. So that's, Mm. you know, a big, a big plus. Um, But yeah, I was on Magic for two and a half years. The sets that I worked on them for that, uh, the the first Eldraine set, uh, the War of the Spark set, those were probably the two sets I had the most influence on. Like there's a, a card named Ginger Brute, which is from the the, the fairy tale Eldraine set, which is basically based on the Gingerbread Man, and it's not very often that you can catch Mark Rosewater off guard with a line of text he's never heard of, and that was creatures can't <laughs> block this unless they have haste, which worked really well for the uh, Gingerbread Story Man. Uh, Incredible! Did you, Did you know that the Ginger no. Brute is now a five E D and D monster? As no, I didn't. <laughs> It's That's now awesome. it, that was put into the latest release that they did on D and D Beyond of the twenty five new monsters. Right. Yeah. Okay. Full yeah. circle there. Awesome. There you go. There um, you go. So I, I I left Wizards in twenty eighteen, and then I I moved over to the game studio that was promptly acquired by Funko. Uh, so the Funko Games right. Division is what they are now, and and I did Horrified for them. Uh, Sort of before the acquisition, after the acquisition, I did uh, Pan Am, Groundhog's Day, uh, sort of the beginning part of the rear window design. So a couple of mass market games uh, there. And in 2021, I left there and moved over to uh, Codename Entertainment, where I'm at now. And they do uh, the digital game Idol Champions of the Forgotten Realms, which is uh, a, a game that, that some D&D fans might, might be familiar with. So I'm you know, back in the D&D world, uh, which has been you know, a lot of fun. And it, it almost feels full circle to me because the, the act, I do a lot of the, the champion, the hero design for, for uh, Idol Champions. And it feels very similar to the miniature design process for the miniature right. game, which... 
I was originally hired for. So a lot of that was how do I translate these beloved characters into a new sort of, you know, mechanical system. And so that that's mm. been uh, a lot of fun to, to work on. And since I've been at one of the, the nice things with Codename um, is for the first time in 15 years, I, I don't have a non-compete where I can do things on the side with board games. Hence, uh, uh, this this aberration game that I've been working on. Say it, Ben. Say speaking of the... Uh... <laughs> speaking of aberration, uh, aberration is Ghostfire Gaming's first uh, board game, uh, our first kind of foray. We did do Fight the Blight, which is more of a card game, but this is our first foray into, a, I think, a full, um, full-bodied uh, board game, um, and it's absolutely incredible. Um, the miniatures are... Speaking of which, absolutely gorgeous for it. I'll be using it for uh, my 5e games, undoubtedly. So the campaign for Aberration is live right now on GameFound. Peter, give us an overview uh, of Aberration. Aberration is basically set in the Iraq Empire, a village that is under siege by the forces of the Great Beast, aberrating the forces of the forest around it. Working on this game, greatly inspired by sort of the, the Seven Samurai, you know, tr training the villagers. Uh, to, to defend mm. a village. Actually, the one that really inspired me was <laughs> a Mandalorian episode. How do you protect this a village from, you know, oncoming forces? So um, it's it's a, a sort of tower defense heroes walking around the or moving around the, the, the village. Yeah, it's it's this fun, <laughs> fun village defense game. Here's the thing is that I'm fascinated by and I'm fascinated all the time, constantly by like the odd places that people get inspiration mm -hmm. for stuff. <laughs> so I love like already you've talked about the idea of like the getting the band back together trope. And now we've got this, you know, Mandalorian inspiration. Do you have any other like weird places that you take inspiration from oh. for game design? I, I, okay, so to, to even to show this through, this is a receipt from the House of the Rock. So this is, you know, House on the Rock receipt dated in August 4th, uh, 2007. So this, oh, okay. this, the House of the Rock uh, is a very strange place in Wisconsin. There is a room of nothing but dolls. There is, you know, a room of a hundred pipe organs. There is a ginormous warehouse with a squid attacking uh, a whale, a sculpture. And I'm, I mean, this is like a three, four story tall whale fighting. I mean, it, it's just something that I, that I can't, you know, explain. I was this one of the first dates I, I uh, went on with my now wife and I was looking at the wall and there was this, this form of three hexes together with another hex. And so right. I scrawled this down on the back of the receipt one way, one day I'm going to make, you know, this is part of a board game board where there are hexes on top of other hex, you know, so yeah, you can get these weird influences yes. from from anywhere. Yeah, I was looking over the design notes for Aberration, you know, speaking of how ideas kind of, you know, spark one thing and then they evolve into another. Um, as you were saying, Aberration focuses on a single village, which I love because to me that's very dark fantasy, this kind of focus down on, on the stories of the little people, you know, and how they survive uh, catastrophe. But I was reminded about how early concepts had the game actually at the scale of the entire Burak Empire. And the idea was that the beast would kind of show up in different places, I believe, correct me if I get any of this wrong, and that all the monsters would kind of then flow towards uh, Altenheim. When, when I'm thinking of sort of the, the, the difference between a board game scope and, and a role-playing game scope, is there, there are sometimes things you can do a board, in a board game that you can't necessarily do as well in in a role-playing game. A role-playing game needs to be a lot more about the characters, not about the empires fighting in, in many ways. You know, even, even if you are, a he you know, in charge of two armies in a role-playing game fighting against each other, you're not going to necessarily have, you know, the full army. You're going to be, you know, doing the story right up, right up front. So when I, we were just throwing around ide ideas for this, I, I brought the scoped out a bit from, you know, what can we do that is different? Uh, but as we were playing and it just wasn't really sitting right and it didn't feel, it didn't feel like it was doing justice to the, the setting. The Great Beast wasn't necessarily ever placed on um, 
the board. He was sort of a boss monster off on the side that you would have to, you know, somehow defeat. And I mean, this is something that came up in Castle Ravenloft is, is how do we make the, the monsters, you know, move? The AI in Castle Ravenloft is pretty complex for a board game where you're going through these lists of instructions. And a lot of my work in, in various similar things is how, how can I make it easier to use this? And that was where the tower defense sort of paths came up where, yep, there are paths throughout the Empire that all led to Altenheim. And mm. that sort of became the influence of paths all through the board that lead to sort of a village center. And that's kind of how that game evolved. As the resident not Ghostfire employee, I'd love to know what the Great Beast is, because right now I'm just picturing the great animal from the Swan Princess. Uh, what inspired me on the Great Beast was actually Princess Mononoke where right. if, you've, if you've got this this big, you know, shadowy thing in the background and, and there's that sort of disease. Okay, it's been like 20 years since I've seen Princess Aunt Mononoke, so I'm sure I'm going to be offending all the fans. But, you know, I'm remembering <laughs> the boar with all that that blight covering it in the beginning and, you know, that sort of thing. That, that the great beast, in my mind, uh, felt like that. Um, but... Uh, Sean, <laughs> hopefully yeah. Sean isn't totally uh, <laughs> frightened by that uh, description or, or no, terrified no. that I brought that up. But so, so I did not create the Great Beast, just so you know. The Great Beast was already established before I joined Ghostfire. Mm -hmm. But the idea behind the Great Beast is it is something that is real, but it is something that is unknowable. Uh, and it is... It can be blamed for a lot of things because it does a lot of things, but no one, the first thing that people asked for after the book came out was, well, give us stats for the great beast. Mm. And the answer was no, because you did not kill mm, the great beast. I like uh, that. <laughs> and so it, and mechanically, it, it has is, a stat block, you can kill it. <laughs> exactly. So mechanically it is unknowable, unreachable, untouchable, and it is behind certain things going on. But we also don't want to pin down what what the Great Beast is for yeah. for various reasons. Uh, so it is also a narrative tool that you can use as the DM to move in different directions. It could be up mm. close and personal with the Great Beast, if that's the way you want to run it. Narratively, it could be the Great Beast is something that some tyrants are going to blame to keep power. It's going to be the fear that, oh, that... Yes, we just slaughtered that small village over there, but uh, it was the great beast that did that. Or, right, oh, th don't go in that direction, villagers, because the great beast is over there. So it's it's, so it's got folk. a lot. Of, it's so folk story. Yeah. You could and even that, call it vague and evocative. Yeah. You could later. call it vague and evocative. <laughs> And now I would love to hear I, uh, what Ben thinks about that. I love the Great Beast as a concept, mm -hmm. and it presents an incredible problem, particularly for an interactive storytelling medium, because as Sean says, it's real, but also, you know, if it presents this amazing villain within the lore of Grim Hollow, this, this you know, towering, shadowy, ethereal, aberrant um, monster that goes around and, and causes villagers to just disappear and, you know, threatens armies and uh, cannot be killed. And it sounds like the very thing that the players immediately are going to be like, oh, we want to kill that thing. But mm -hmm. what it thematically represents is the, the um, inevitability of death. Uh, it represents moral decay. It, it represents corruption. It represents th that the time of Etheris is running out. You know, it's not going to continue on. And so by defeating it, while I think that should be an option in individual folks' games if that's what they want to do, defeating it defeats the narrative purpose and the thematic purpose of featuring it in your campaign in the first place. So we've done a couple of videos now, also inspired by Aberration, the board game, kind of, you know, going back the other way. We've done a couple of videos on our YouTube channel kind of being like, this is how I would tackle it if I was going to feature it in a campaign, knowing that. It can't be defeated. This is the sort of campaign you could run. But what you've opened my mind to, Sean, which I which I love, is like, 
what if it doesn't exist? You know, what if it's this phantom that's so real in the minds of 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 the people of the Burak Empire, but in actuality, it is just an excuse to you know, and a, and a, a GM could easily take it in that direction, you know, and just be like, yeah, you know what? For my campaign, it is only a story, but. Uh, you know, it rep because it represents moral corruption. It is going to represent the moral corruption of the leaders of this, you know, region of the Burak Empire who are using it as a way to blame, you know, or or maybe they invented the story of the Great Beast because they don't know what's going on. You know, these aberrations are wandering out of the forest, and they're like, oh yeah, um, the Great Beast. You know, we gotta oh, everybody rally up. We gotta we gotta you know go and defeat it. Um, or as is typical, the opposite in Burak, it's, it's illegal to talk about the Great Beast because it suggests that the, you know, the the Empire no longer has power in its region. Um, mm. uh, yeah, there's a lot, lot of different things you can do with it. So I'm fascinated, Peter, about the challenge of, you know, having that same challenge of like, how do you make this monster you can't kill and really can't interact with or defeat the purpose of having it as the villain of this board game? Well, I mean, one big, one big thing was, well... Do we feature a great beast miniature? You know, that was that was yeah. a, a topic of conversation. And like exactly, that was one big yeah. thing is well this How big is how, it? How yeah. how exactly how big is it? Because you know, most of the miniatures, you know, if it's a, a, a two inch square base, you know, of you know, a forty eight millimeter miniature or something, that's gonna look too small. And that's probably the biggest that I think we have in aberration right now is sort of the the, the miniatures around that size. You know, is it a huge? That's going to feel too small for the great, you know, so it, it, it mm. ends up being, oh, it's, you know, going to be more expensive than the rest of the game and you're never going to really fight it. So, you know, we did we did at one point early in the um, the village version, we did have a a little great beast indicator moving around the edge of the yeah. the. Uh, the board where, you know, indicating where monsters might spawn from just as a, a lead, you know, a, a way for players to be able to, oh, I think the, the monsters are going to come from over there because that's where, that's where we most recently saw the Great Beast or something like that. But mm-hmm. um, it ended up making too much of the board uh, like, oh, we could ignore the board over there because the Great Beast is down there. And right. it, it just ended up in the long run being better if the threat could come from all over, but somewhere off in the distance, you know, the great beast is, is, you know, lurking and, and his, corrupting the, the, the area. I also really like this idea that, um, speaking of, you know, odd places for inspiration, I suppose, or odd connections, it's got this sort of Terry Pratchett anthropomorphic personification, but dark, like, <laughs> you know, if you've ever read the hog father, it's a whole story where it's like, these are concepts, but they're also personified. How do you kill someone like death? How do you kill someone like, you know, who, who is just this this sure. concept of all the corruption and fear or whatever? I think uh, fits really well, but it's like a spooky version of it instead of a, a holiday comedy romp. <laughs> <laughs> go, yep. go read The Hogfather, but focus on the philosophy chat. <laughs> it's good. <Yep. laughs> the players can win. But that is not victory over the great beast. That is like save that village, right? And that it, it, um, it's, you survive the night, but you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. The, the next night might be also a threat, and you're just gonna have to play the game again to see how that night goes. You know, so I mean, it's not like you can ever truly win the game. You know, there's you can just lose, and then you're gonna have to go save another. Despair um, prevails. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. To, Welcome to, to 2021, 2020, despair prevails. <laughs> uh, welcome to Grim Hollow. Um, yeah. <laughs> to answer a quick question from Cosmic Postman, uh, in terms of like uh, avatars for the Great Beast or things that the the party can fight, there are monsters like the Caprathorn is kind mm-hmm. of a, a pretty good avatar of the Great Beast and is the boss monster included in the core box of uh, Aberration. Um, and the Monster Grimoire kind of outlines, you know, a, a bunch of different monsters specifically that are tied to it. So you can have the party kind of fight representations yeah. of the beast. And that representation might not be a monster. Again, like uh, as Sean pointed out before, it could be uh, a local ruler who's, you know, become corrupted by the beast, both metaphorically and perhaps literally turning into this Cthulian kind of monster. I've been reading Berserk lately and the, the Count is, a, is an awesomely terrifying character that could feature in a beast campaign. Um, sorry, I'm getting off track. We have the core box. 
Uh, we also have a couple of expansions coming mm-hmm. uh, that will be part of the Game Found campaign, uh, including the Spellcasters expansion. <laughs> Can you quickly talk, Peter, about how they might change the game? Why people might sure. want to grab hold of those as well? So when we were when we were working on uh, the core game, I, I purposely avoided spellcasters to start with, just because I knew spells are, are fun. You know, we want to do something a little. And we don't bit want anybody having that. fun. You know, we don't want to fe- feel fun. <laughs> in the, I mean, and and more, not sure where where the components could go. What we're looking at right now for the spellcasters, and this is you know a work in progress. So in you know when the game comes out, things might be different. That's how game design works. Uh, so you're seeing a snapshot. <laughs> I'm, the snapshot of where things are right now is one of the expansions will have you know four classes that sort of represent you know a. a Full arcane caster and a half arcane caster. I don't want to quite say a bard because they're not going to be wandering around a village with a with a no. loot, but it's it's more going to be like a a spell sword sort of character, something that that you know is is a, a git sort of character uh, for the arcane yeah, yeah. casters. And then there will be sort of a divine, you know, inquisitor type character for the main divine spellcaster, and then what. Right now, we're calling the the Vindicator, which is I don't want to say a paladin, but something more of a half, you know, half uh, divine spellcaster. Um, one one thought, of, and, and you know, still working this out is maybe it's some sort of more of like a, a divine ninja, <laughs> where it, it has a lot more, you know, <laughs> uh, movement like uh, uh, abilities. So you know, uh, we're we're still working out exactly how that's going to all. Come together. That's that's a problem for next for Thursday. Me actually, that's so, gonna be yeah, my next D and D character, a divine ninja. Divine ninja. Yeah. Divine ninja. yeah. <laughs> Normally, uh, in in aberration, when you're playing a character, you've got you know the, what actions you can take, and those are are very self contained to your character. So if you're you know if you're the captain, you're gonna have a lot of of you know uh, fighting uh, melee fighting and uh, abilities for interacting with the villagers. You know, but they're they're always going to be the same, no matter every time you play the captain or every time you play the monster hunter, every time you play the the rogue, every time you play those sorts of characters. They're, the abilities are going to be the same. The spellcaster is going to be a little bit different. Where at the start of the game, you'll have a selection of spells that you can take along. So right. there's going to be a little bit more of a. Um, flexibility or characters aberration is live on game found right now so that you can go and back it um if you go to game found oh man i actually don't have a link for it i'll get a link there's a link up there it's coming uh, over there and there's a link down in the description (laughs) but for the twitch chat uh, maybe it'll show up in twitch chat sometime soon who knows yeah who knows it could (laughs) happen you know maybe someone is on the back end saving our butts (laughs) who that could be the case you know i don't know who else listens to this uh, while it's live i'm not sure but speaking of things going live and perhaps surprisingly uh, announced literally hours after we finished recording the lorecast last week was dungeons and dragons or dnd beyond maps i don't know if that's all part of the title or it's just maps but they basically just dropped a VTT semi out of nowhere uh, last week. Uh, it is not the VTT. The VTT. Yeah. It uh, is little, AVTT. Little T. Yeah, it's AVTT. It'll tide you over. <laughs> yeah, until they get the other one uh, ironed out. Um, I know Teos had a bit of a play with it. Uh, you can go find his YouTube video at AlphaStream, I believe, is his YouTube channel. Um, mm-hmm. But if you have a master tier uh, subscription, you can also just go check it out. I went and played with it. I think it's pretty sick. Taos's video gives a pretty good overview of the same, like I had pretty similar thoughts. Uh, Sean, have you taken a look at it? I did. I spent five minutes today looking at it and I thought, where were you in 2002 and in 2008 and in 2012 and in 2014 when I needed you? Because it's exactly what I wanted. I don't need bells and whistles. All I need is the, the ability to put a map up put tokens on and have players able to move their tokens while a DM moves their tokens. And that's what it's, Mm. that's what it does. And it's perfect. And it's, I, I don't like to run online games because of the prep time it takes. Mm. If you can prep an encounter in 30 seconds, I might be willing to set and play online for a little bit more uh, than, than I would normally. So I was very excited for this. And I've always wondered if the 3D VTT is going to be too much for people. 
Uh, it might right. be great. It might be wonderful for people that want that full video game like experience. But for certain segments of the population, i.e. me, uh, I don't need all that. I just I want to be able to say, here's the monster. Where do you move? Good. Roll dice. Good. Let's move on to the next player. And I was astounded and overjoyed when that happened. And they already have some maps up there that you can play with mm. if you buy certain things and sort of you can link it pretty? to your campaign. What? Are they pretty? The maps. Yeah. Yeah. The, the maps Good. in maps Good. are exactly, <laughs> they're exactly like the maps that you would buy in the adventure. Fan Delver and below, you can go grab the map right now. What, what I love about them specifically in terms of like answering, are they pretty, is that they have a selection of just, for, here's a forest, here's mm -hmm. a, you know, here's a, a field, here's a cave, here's a, you know, whatever, just texture kind of maps and things, which when I was prepping games online was one of the hardest things to do is just like a random encounter while they're traveling through the forest. Now I have to go find a forest map to be my generic forest map, which you know, wasn't hard necessarily, but it just, you know, a lot of, a lot of, um, uh, uh, map makers that are doing things on Patreon, uh, I absolutely love their maps. They're gorgeous. I used a lot of them. I was subscribed to a lot of Patreons for map making over, um, quarantine, but the weakness was a lot of them are very specific. Here's a witch's hut. Here's a, a, a dungeon filled with mushrooms. Yeah. Here's a temple that's been desecrated or whatever. And it's like, I just need some trees. I <laughs> just need some trees um, for this particular encounter. So, yeah, the usability on it's awesome. Have you not played with it yet, Dale? I haven't gotten a chance to play with it yet. I was going to do that this morning with the extra hour and a half we had, but instead I slept in. Um <laughs> 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 on brand uh yep. but i am excited for it in terms of i think it's a really good tool for the toolkit of D, &D beyond because yeah. you know one of the things i've noticed that i've brought up a couple times on the podcast is a lot of people use D, &D beyond at the table i'm a big fan of paper sheets but i have so many friends who when they're playing in person around a table bring their phone bring their ipad whatever and they just pull up their D, D Beyond character sheet there and they'll roll, you know, physical dice at the table, yeah. but they're looking, they're referencing their character sheet. And for that, it's so, so handy to also be able to have a digital map that you're referencing and people can move around their tokens, but you don't have to do the rest of it on the map. You know what I mean? You can just look at it. Everyone around the table can look at it and go, ah, I see where the goblins are in relation to myself. And then it actually helps out bridging that gap between theater of the mind and being on the grid uh, that sometimes the mechanics fight. I agree with you entirely, and I think that's the way I would use it as well. That's but funny because would... you're saying that as though you're about to disagree with me. Well, <laughs> well, no, what is this it's tone? Not, it's not a disagreement. It's just a, a, an acknowledgement that it is awesome how kind of seamless it is when you go in because it asks you to load up a campaign and so I was like, all right, I'll load up my um, the campaign that I'm currently running, my home game. I have two players in D&D &D Beyond uh, and the other two are, or the other three are not in D&D &D Beyond because they're using a lot of uh, Grim Hollow content. So it's hard to, to make that happen. Oh, yeah. But <laughs> those two characters, not only did they load in straight away and I could click on, uh, there's a little section where you click your tokens and you go to your characters and it just pulls in a token with the character art they've chosen on D&D Beyond for their character, drops them in, and not only that, it had their roles from our... Nobody's rolled in D&D Beyond for like three weeks, three or four weeks, because they prefer physical dice, but it had the roles in there from like sessions ago, all wow. listed in like a battle log uh, all the way up. So like just the... The, and I had that going in five, ten minutes. Uh, the the ease of that, uh, I was really Which, impressed by. Which, I mean, by. I just want to throw back to when we first heard that D&D &D Beyond uh, were going to be a attaching a virtual tabletop. Way back when, one of the main things that we were saying is that their huge advantage over other digital tabletops is that they have the character data already in there and they can yeah. just kind of import it and attach them so you don't have to build your character sheet from scratch in yeah. a different virtual tabletop. So, I mean, it is interesting to see it coming about. The one thing it doesn't do, which I kind of like, is it doesn't necessarily seem to allow you to create maps within it. 
Um, it will allow you to import maps from adventures that you've purchased. Um, Fandelver and Below is already compatible with it, and there a couple of other adventures are as well. They're saying all future releases will be compatible with uh, maps. Um, but there's still a place for your Ark and Forge, your Dungeon Draft, yeah. your you know whatever it is, because it allows you to import maps and then set the grid scale and everything in it, which I think is really great. Mm. Or those you know, Patreon uh, map That's makers. really cool. And I think it's not overreaching because if they did try to have a uh, build your own map function in there, uh, no shade on any other programs, but sometimes when you try to do that extra little bit, it comes out looking maybe a little bit less good than it could yeah. uh, otherwise. So I think I think that's a, a good way to tackle it. I think that the, the D&D Beyond team who are doing this stuff have really figured out who uses them and for what. Um, and I think that that's really, really cool. And it is interesting seeing this shift towards digital, right? Like when I did the the, the giant sized game at Gen Con with Wizards, I I asked for a physical copy of my character sheet, and I was and ridiculed by everybody. Game Pick said, "What's wrong with you? <laughs> You're a freak." <laughs> <laughs> that's so, just me. You know, even I mean, Jay Craw, way- even Jay Craw's headed towards the digital. The way they tried to sell it, which which I like about, you know, as I mentioned, I managed to get my characters in and all their roles were there from previous sessions, was that it is, uh, you know, it's play where you want to play in some capacity. So you can uh, play on this VTT if you can't all get together for a session or use it in person. Then you can go and do an in-person uh, game where you're using purely, um, you know, physical dice miniatures, the way I prefer to play as well, Pete. Um, uh, but uh, they've still got their D&D Beyond characters there, so they're not needing to to change anything. And then you can load them into their upcoming 3D VTT uh, if you want to do a session there, you know, as well. So you, yeah, you know, if you want to stream the game easily, but have it be pretty. All, all they're they're kind of covering all their bases, but through yeah. different the, sectors. The plug and play, you know, uh, uh, feature of it is is impressive. Um, so yeah, go check it out. Speaking of uh, Wizard of the Coast, they've also got Planescape uh, coming, which uh, is once again broken into three books, similar to Spelljammer, and I believe was was Dragonlance three books or two books? I can't remember. Not three. important. Anyway. Um, uh, actually, it was oh, five. Was three? Oh, okay. okay I'm, I'm lying. <laughs> Just um, before people correct me in chat, I'm, <laughs> I'm lying. I'm making it up. <laughs> it was a joke. <laughs> Sigil and the Outlands will be their uh, law compendium. Uh, Mort's Planar Parade will be their bestiary. And Turn of Fortune's Wheel is their adventure. Um, who's excited for Planescape? Can I get a hell yeah? Yeah, <laughs> that's a hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like Justice Arman uh, saying in a recent video that it was like uh, the uh, Sigil is like the backstage of the multiverse where Mario and Bowser kind of walk off the edges of the game and then are friends and go get a drink, you know? It's uh, a me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all it my all analogies from now We've on. Come all from the circle. <laughs> Was that recently announced? I yeah, yeah, I think just the other day they okay. did the the breakout. They've uploaded a couple of videos to their YouTube channel. Okay. It looks cool. Yeah. I don't want a piece of it whatsoever. But it looks cool for people who do. I'm sure there are lots of Planescape fans who don't want a piece of Grim Hollow. It's just how it goes. That's great. That's it, it's, that's that's what that's what I love about the hobby. There's a place for everybody to just go and and find their corner of the multiverse. And sometimes they want it to be a gated community like Grim Hollow. Anyway, um, I'm kidding. Other topic of interest: uh, Alpha Stream, co-host of the second best tabletop RPG podcast in all the realms. Uh, Teos has done an article which has a breakdown of D&D sales uh, over the past, like, long while by the looks mm-hmm. of it. I did a bit of a dig into this. Uh, the article, if you can go to the AlphaStream blog, uh, which I believe is just alphastream.com. If somebody's going to copy and paste. Uh, thank you, Sean. Thank you for mm-hmm. correcting me. Um, you can go to alphastream.org. It does kind of clarify that this sales data is not complete. Uh, it is, I believe, retail sales. Maybe, Sean, you take over from this point and go. Yeah, it's it's supposedly uh, this came out because a publisher found that their distributor gave them this information. So it's sort of third-hand information, but it's only big box stores plus Amazon. And even oh. then, Amazon 
doesn't always give the full data to this organization, but you can sort of put together some numbers if you squint a little bit and figure things out. And it so it showed, you know, the millions of players' handbooks that were sold uh, for 5e, and then all numbers of things going down through all the Wizards products plus licensed products. And so you can extrapolate what sales were such that like the the licensed cookbook sold more than a lot of the adventures, oh. which shows where role playing games are on a scale with other well, publications. Well, uh, this is interesting because now correct me if I'm wrong, because I I've, the, the term big box store, I don't think that's a, a term commonly used in Australia. Does that mean like okay. your Walmart, your Target, your kind yes. of like Kmart? Yeah. Kmart. Mm-hmm. Okay, oh, wait, cool. America doesn't really have Kmart anymore, do you? We we sort of we lost still Kmart. have Kmart. We still have Kmart. <laughs> Congratulations, um, big W. Uh, love a good lettered uh, uh, yeah. big box store. Okay, so what ma- what's interesting about this data and Taos kind of clarifies this or, or or puts this as a disclaimer is like any conclusions that you draw out of it uh, really need to be hypothesis based on uh, knowing that this is a subset of data, not the whole picture. And so mm-hmm. the fact that uh, like the cookbook sells better than um the adventures i wonder if that's a a, a result and again this is only hypothesis you can't draw a conclusion but i wonder if that's a a, a result of the fact that we are looking at big box store data what well, you're right because i was thinking there like is one advantage data. that something like a cookbook has over the others is that if a family member wants to buy you something for christmas they know you like D, but they don't know what you've already got yeah it's a safer or they just bet know you to like get fantasy. you, right? They're like, this looks fun, right? Yeah. Um, but I don't know whether that would have as big an impact as we're talking here. I mean, I, we have seen before as well, like this is what led to the original sort of OGL, right? Was the idea that D&D, when they publish adventures, it's only appealing to such a small, like narrow window of their, their buyer base. So it in some ways was better to focus on publishing stuff that everyone would want to buy and let the third party groups publish adventures. Am I remembering that correctly? Is that part of what led to the original OGL? I think that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. It (laughs) was in the realm of this is a good thing for the whole industry as well as good for Wizards of the Coast. So this is something that that should should be done. I think Teos's point, though, we we don't know it yet because this is just part one of what he's looking at. He just wanted in this first one to get out the... uh, the information and to frame it in a way that the reader would understand where this information came from, why it can be looked at uh, as as decent information, but with this skeptical eye, understanding that this doesn't count uh, like local gaming stores. This doesn't count other places yeah. where games might be bought, but. Overall, we can um, imagine that these numbers play out throughout the whole uh, realm of where things are sold. And it's also because when you look at like friendly local game stores as well, they, they're they going to have a probably a different spread of what people are buying, but they're also going to have a much smaller percentage of buyers um, mm. compared to something like Amazon, you know? Yeah, I mm. guess that's true. I guess that's true because my thought had been like, you know, I know that in a in a Target, in a Kmart, in a Big W, in all these stores you never heard of, in a Walmart, I know that there are D&D books there, right? But I personally, as someone who's, uh, you know, relatively deeply invested in the hobby, relatively, um, would not go to one of those stores to buy a D&D book. Firstly, because yeah, I think they're probably going to overprice Yeah, I went to my local Zing recently. Them. The D&D section has really gone downhill. Oh, it's dwindled at Zing, hasn't it? Oh, um, it has. But, uh, You're just making up names now. There's no such thing. Yeah, I don't Zing. know what that means <laughs> and you at know. all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, um, sometimes Peter, they just make up things and try to fool us Americans, yeah, yeah, but yeah. we're not going to fall for it. No, no but, but also the, the range at a big box store of adventures, like is a Walmart going to stock how many copies of like Vandelver and Below or because Curse of again, Strahd or whatever Because brick and mortar versus the long tail effect, right? Because brick and mortar have to stock things that they're pretty sure they're going to move. Whereas yeah, yeah. something like Amazon can afford to 
stock everything. Because I mean, I know from video games, and this is a generalization, um, but I know from video games, they will tend to stock, you know, more of the big budget games that they know are going to move your FIFAs, your Call of Duties, whatever, but they'll only stock a handful of like some obscure, you know, smaller game as opposed to going to an EB games uh, uh, where, or a, related to let me translate GameStop, um, literally the same company as Zing. Um, yeah. They, you know, they will have a good range of most of the most recent games, even if those games are relatively obscure. Except they don't have Baldur's Gate because they only re- released that digitally on uh, console. So there's my gripe. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what happened actually with um, my friend went to buy me Baldur's Gate 3 for my birthday this year and went into an, an EB Games and said, could I buy Baldur's Gate? They said, no, digital only. And so then my friend was like, okay, well, can I buy a gift card? And they, they were selling them... Um, Steam gift cards, but they they would only sell four twenty dollar Steam gift cards, not like one hundred dollar gift card. It was a a very bizarre situation. That is odd. That I had to one odd. by one go through and scratch off the code. <laughs> yeah, it's just an extra game for you to play at the That's end. That's right. Of, it's uh, all part of the game. Yeah. yeah, it's like a scratchy that you always win. <laughs> Um, uh, all right, let us, that being the news for the week, let us uh, quickly jump into uh, a listener question. I want to shout out Vin. Vin from last week asked the question, what is our email address? Uh, Dale Kingsmill, what is our email address? Uh, I believe it is podcast at ghostfiregaming.com. Correct. Um, uh, I say, like I'm marking your scorecard. Um, I panic every time. <laughs> Great, good. That's the the slight panic uh, is what I uh, wish to inflict. Question comes uh, from uh, Boy Dolphin, I believe this was, asking a question earlier, um, asking Peter, what is one thing that you learned uh, the most about play about the playtest feedback process? How do you differentiate between good feedback and probably what's not particularly useful? Um, you know, those sort of things. That's a great question. Numbers are great, especially large collated numbers. So my experience is definitely more with the fifth edition playtest with than than the current one. We had a lot of surveys that would say, oh, rate this class ability from one to five. What I would often start with first is going through those numbers as opposed to the individual comments, because you know, the individual comments, I can get whatever. I can cherry pick whatever comment I want to get whatever narrative I want, because, you know, when there's 6,000 people entering, you know, answering these surveys, you know, everyone is going to have a different opinion over all sorts of different things. Going by the numbers first is is always uh, what I what I prefer to do. The first thing I would do with that would, would be going through sort every single player's handbook class ability and see which ones are scoring lower, low and which ones are, are scoring high. And I would focus in on like, oh, the, you know, the Druid's wild shape ability is, is not, you know, pleasing players compared to other things. And then I would, that's when I would go through and, and look at the, the actual comments to try and find out why are people right. unhappy with something. That's Use the numbers to get the hard data and then yeah. look at the comments to figure out why. Individual comments are great, and that's really important, but that's to find out why, not necessarily where the problems are. Yeah. Um, I have dealt with smaller scale play tests uh, sure. for, for different things. Doing so right now, actually, for some Grim Hollow stuff. And you know, I'm dealing with like 60 p- people f- feedback, and I'm <laughs> going nearly around the bend. So I can't even imagine a feedback... Uh, of that scale for as many people that that touched D D next uh fifth edition tip my hat to the, mr peter there's Lee. a reason i call it opening the ark of the covenant because it yeah. really just break melts your brain when you're looking through all this data how yeah. many how many revisions because i know that you're not on the inside of the the design work that's going on now for for one D D, peter um so you're not speaking to that directly mm-hmm. but i'm just curious you know, this process to the public now has felt relatively protracted. It's been probably about a year that they've re- been releasing these um, playtest packets and then reviewing them and then, you know, tweaking them and putting them out, kind of leapfrogging when they do yeah. the Warlock next, et cetera. Um, how long was the, the D&D next 
playtest period? And was it as exhaustive as what they're doing now? I want to say it was closer to two years. Um, yeah, okay. But that is that is a that is a that is a brain cell that uh, has <laughs> has you know sat in there without <laughs> electrical impulse breath. for many years, so <laughs> it may be hallucinating. <laughs> Some sort of update every month. You know that was right. what we'd like to do, but often the amount of work couldn't be done in one month on something. So what would often happen is we'd be doing the work on one part while getting the the survey results on another, and we'd we'd like you know we'd be working on this while this survey is out, and then we switch over to this while the survey for the first part is out, and we you know sort of cycle through that. So there's always something going on. We're always working on something, but. Um, mm-hmm. If you actually looked, when do you see the you know the next iteration of the rogue? It might be three or four months, you know. So yeah. there's enough time for us to iterate on it. And oh, and yeah, to to talk a little bit, Ben, maybe what you were talking about was I was sort of in a group that play tested things before it went into the packets that went out to the general public. So yeah. we would do our pass, you know, check out things, hand it back. Maybe it would get iterated again and then sent to the public for the larger and, you know, scale of one to five sort of uh, testing yeah. that that uh, Peter's talking about. Different targeting that, would, you know. Uh, speaking of targeting things, I went through the Lawcast analytics recently. Did you know we currently have 6,500 subscribers on Spotify, YouTube, uh, iTunes kind of combined? So we're going to set a target of 10,000 subscribers across all platforms before the end of the year. And if we reach it, uh, I don't know, Dante will do a face reveal or something. Anyway, this has <laughs> been uh, this week's episode of the Eldritch Lawcast. We are going to be back on Twitch next year, next year, next week, actually, much sooner than that. Uh, it is going to be 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And if you're in Australia, it's going to be 10 a.m., uh, Eastern Australian Standard Time next week because of daylight savings. We are moving the times around. Woohoo! Can I get a <laughs> hell yeah for more sunlight? Um, uh, <laughs> or you can find us on YouTube. You might be watching us there right now. Uh, we're on all audio platforms as well. Wherever the number one podcast can be found, we're there because it, it's us. Um, uh, so we will catch you somewhere in the near future. I've been Ben Byrne. Uh, Thank you, Peter, for joining us again uh, on this episode. It's been great. Thanks for having me. Uh, uh, And I'm going to do my bit again because I like to do the runoff. I've been Ben Byrne here with Dale Kingsmill, Sean Merwin, Peter Lee, and we will be back next week. Babada, babada, babada. Babada, babada, You went right back to the babada, babadas. Yeah. Yeah. Dante's not going to be happy. Your soul is weak. Is that what we should do right. <laughs> in the next couple of weeks? No bubbaters. We're going. We're going on a no bubbaters. You're the strike. one who called for no bubbaters, and then you did yeah. it. That's true. I you did do the bubbaters. You re, <laughs> re- Oh, we forgot to. Oh.